Welcome to another episode of Dr. Doctor, the award-winning radio show and podcast featuring your physician hosts, Dr. Tom McGovern and Dr. Andrew Mullally, where we and our guests discuss relevant and health-related topics from an authentically Catholic perspective. Dr. Doctor is brought to you in part by the generous underwriting of CMF Curo. Learn more at mycatholichealthcare.org. Live your Catholic faith in your health care with CMF Curo. Today, our guest will be heard across the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Joining us will be brother and doctor Columba Thomas, a Dominican brother who recently translated the medieval classic book called Ars Moriendi. That's Latin for the art of dying. It's the first time Ars Moriendi has been available to the general public in modern English, and it was published by our friends at the National Catholic Bioethics Center. But before delving deeply into today's topic, perhaps we'd like to let you, our listeners, know about some good news we received just yesterday, the day before recording this. Yes, it's for the third year in a row, the radio program, Dr. Doctor, has received a Gabriel Award, which is really exciting. Our single story for national release uh, won an honorable mention for the English language runner up. version. Runner up. You run her up. I'm sorry. Yeah, see, <laughs> I should let Tom explain this. But we, we did a good uh, a story on human trafficking, doctors learning from patients, which our listeners will remember that really compelling story that shone the light on what it was like to be a human trafficking victim and some of the signs to watch for for people who might be suffering from human trafficking. I think many people don't realize how much that world kind of interacts with medicine and it's an opportunity for us to reach out to them. And so we were very excited to get that award again. Yeah, the Gabriel Awards are run by the Catholic Media Association, but they recognize any media, whether it's Catholic or secular. Uh, and they said for the best in film, broadcasting and cross platform media. Uh, and they specifically target when we're looking at themes of dignity, compassion, community, and uh, justice. So uh, thanks for helping make our show successful. It, uh, you know, without you listeners, uh, we wouldn't be here because we're here for you. Yeah, so please continue listening and uh, share the good news of Dr. Doctor with a friend, as we like to say. Amen. Now, Andrew, if I remember correctly, the idea for the topic uh, episode on the art of dying that we're doing now came because of a comment you got from your sister. That's right. I, uh, my, my biggest fans are my family, uh, and that is a, an honor. And just like when I was homeschooled and mom was rooting for me to win the homeschool prize, of course, I was the only one running in sixth grade science fair. Uh, <laughs> they were rooting for me then, and they're rooting for me now. And so uh, my sister was listening to Dr. Doctor and came across uh, this idea, especially about the art of dying. And it, it might have been my dad also who made a comment about it. It's such an important thing that's rarely talked about, I think, in medicine. I would say secular medicine especially is focused wholly on optimizing physical health and alleviating pain. While these are primary objectives of medicine as Catholic physicians, we appreciate that they're secondary to our spiritual health. And frequently, the, the pursuit of physical health and spiritual health kind of overlap uh, for what is the pursuit of obvious good. However, as we age and death is undeniably approaching, how we spend our time preparing, I think, is critical. In secular, secular medicine, there's commonly a push for even more optimizing of pain relief and even to the point sometimes where you, you'd hear people denying how close death may be. For Christians, Death is different. Uh, death is the final challenge, and I would say even opportunity to grow closer to Christ. And you know, Andrew, it gives would us you time. say that uh, right now with secular medicine, that focuses often on extending just the time of our life, but our focus really should be on the quality of our life so that we're prepared for death. Do you think that's a big difference in what you've seen in, in secular training in medicine? It depends how you view the purpose of life. Um, the old Baltimore Catechism says that we were made to know, love, and serve God in this world and to be happy with him forever in the next. Amen. Um, secular medicine does not think about that. Secular medicine thinks about, okay, please rate this uh, this hospital stay as very good. Um, <laughs> please don't bounce back and get readmitted within 30 days. Um, how are we controlling your pain on the sad face to smiley face scale? <laughs> so they're thinking about different things where properly oriented Christians are thinking about meeting God face to face and 
having to stand for individual judgment, which is very sobering. Um, but I think it's also a huge blessing for the people who do know that death is near. Yet yeah, they have time to prepare, you know, and it has to be looked at that way. And uh, I think our guest tonight is going to tell us how even we as physicians can uh, help do that. But anybody listening can help somebody close to them do it and help themselves do it better. You know, um, worldwide, about 61 million people will die this year. Each of them needs to prepare to meet eternity. And there are current groups out there who say they are concerned about death, but they're, they think death is the end, like the the former Hemlock Society, known as Compassion and Choices. Well, it's really not compassionate to deny um, heaven. You know, my mom's side of the family has this, uh, what I used to think was a bizarre family tradition. There is a happy death crucifix that gets passed around our family on my mom's side from person to person. But it reminded me when our recent uh, or our previous bishop about 10 years ago now died, John Darcy, he actually was in the hospital several days before he died at home. And he asked for the crucifix to be taken off the wall and he hugged it with him in his bed, took it home with him and died with it there. And it also reminds me of that great picture taken on Good Friday, 2005, just eight days before Pope John Paul II died. He was in his chapel uh, during the Stations of the Cross, hugging this enormous crucifix to himself. Um, wow. But Andrew, you've done something I haven't. You've actually witnessed people die. What do you, what's that like? You know, I, I would say even on the medical side of things, it's it's maybe not representative of what we think dying should look like. Frequently, in, at least in family medicine training, when you're, you know, especially the new people on the totem pole, a new doctor, and you're spending the nights in the hospital, when someone is uh, attempting to die or their vital signs are slowly getting worse, they'll have a code blue. And it's your job to go up there and try and stop that process by uh, giving them the ventilator or intubating them if needed and giving CPR, and you try and resuscitate them, um, this is not what I would think a happy death looks like. Now, everybody we're talking about in the hospital, a lot of times it's a surprise that they're dying. Um, by nature of them being in the hospital, people who anticipate death frequently are not in the ICU doing everything they can. But it, it's a challenging time because especially when you can tell people are not prepared to, de to die, they're doing everything possible, really yes. going to extraordinary lengths to extend life. And that can be juxtaposed with people, you know, and I, I see them in the clinic who, as they are approaching death, you know, from cancer, or from something else that they can anticipate, there's a peace about them. And you can see that juxtaposed with people constantly going to the hospital, trying every single medical therapy. Um, and I, sometimes I'll try and approach it with them like, hey, you know, uh, do you go to church? You know, how, how are you dealing with the nature of this diagnosis? And you see widely different responses and it's really scary. You know, I think part of our job is to let people know, yes, you're in fact dying so you can prepare, but a lot of secular medicine does not value that. that. They think if anything, it might hurt. Well, let's get to the, the practical advice to prepare for eternity, but to get there, we have to go through the medical trivia question of the day. Not surprisingly, the category is where Americans die. The question, 71% of Americans say that they want to die at home. According to a December 2019 New England Journal of Medicine article, where is the most common place Americans die? So that's part one, where? And how close is that percentage of those dying at home to that 71% aspirational goal. You'll have to wait until the end of the show for the answer. We'll be back here on Dr. Doctor after the break with brother and Dr. Columba Thomas about the art of dying here on Dr. Doctor. Welcome back to today's interview with brother and Dr. Columba Thomas, a Dominican and physician. He's studying for the priesthood, in fact, was recently ordained a deacon and next year, 2023, will be, God willing, ordained a priest. He's a physician who specializes in internal medicine, who did his medical school at Yale, then a primary care residency and chief residency also at Yale before he joined the Dominicans in 2016. A unique uh, professional career path. I guess being a brother is more than a career. It's a calling. Um, he's currently in ministry work at St. Joseph's on Capitol Hill, 
I guess it would be Washington, D.C., and you'll be beginning postdoctoral fellowship in bioethics at Georgetown in July of this year. He's published articles in JAMA Internal Medicine, the Journal of General Internal Medicine, the Journal of the American Geriatric Society, and the National Catholic Bioethics Quarterly. And last September, he published an annotated translation of the Ars Moriendi, The Art of Dying, through the National Catholic Bioethics Center. Brother Columba, welcome to Dr. Doctor. Thanks for having me. Hey, this is great. So you've not only got the letters OP for Order of Preachers behind your name, but also MD. There's got to be a great story there. What is it? It's true that I trained as a physician before entering religious life and preparing for the priesthood. The thing about it that's hardest to explain, I would say, is that I never regretted for an instant doing my medical training. I loved it and had some exciting opportunities ahead of me. But I prefer to think of it as one vocation with a couple of parts to it. When I was in <laughs> medical school, I came across the Dominicans and started going to a Dominican parish. And gradually over time, I would say, I became more and more certain that God was calling me to religious life as a Dominican. And so basically, it, it gradually came together in God's time. And the challenge at this point, now that I've entered religious life and have been preparing for the priesthood, is just figuring out how all of it fits together. And God has been very generous with me and helping me along the way in that. Well, we, we're very excited to have you on the program because this is something that I'm passionate about. I know one, one of the things we wanted to start with is the difference between death and dying. Uh, it seems like many people would say we're living up until the moment of death uh, and, and then we die. But what is the idea of dying and why is that important for us to understand? Thanks for asking about the difference between those two terms. I don't think I've ever been asked that before <laughs> specifically. But in a nutshell, dying is a process and an opportunity for growing closer with God, for growing in virtue and preparing to enter into eternal life with him. And death, on the other hand, is the moment at which the soul leaves the body. And in our medical training, we learn how to pronounce death, which means that we can say that death has already occurred, but we can't actually, by observation, know exactly when the soul has left the body. And so it's a mystery to us. But it is really important to distinguish between dying and death. And I think you make a really good point that people who are dying are still alive. And actually, one of the main takeaways from the Ars Moriendi text that I'm going to be talking about is that the art of dying is the art of living as well. And we should be spending every single day of our lives preparing for entering into eternal life with God. Every single day, because no nobody knows the hour or the day. That's right. Um you, you know, it reminds me, my, my patron saint is uh, Thomas More. He's near and dear to my heart for a number of reasons. And when he was on his way to be um, beheaded, there's a story that he told somebody else that, oh, how sad you're on the ox cart. I guess an ox was pulling a cart he was on um, to be to die. And his response was, we're all on ox carts. Some are just going faster than others. And yeah, that's, right. that's always okay. stuck with me. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that St. Thomas More is actually a really great example for us today because he held to his principles and his faith was strong enough that he was able to go boldly forward uh, and he was ready to, to meet his maker. Um, but that was kind of in the face of very strong societal forces. And there were many people close to him who were opposed to the position that he took because they wanted him to take the easy route. But thanks be to God, he did have the strength to follow through with that. And I think that we can benefit from that example even today. So speaking of today, in one of the articles I read reviewing your book, it said that there are some competing views of death in our society. How would you um, categorize those? Sure. I would say by and large, there's consensus that death is a thing. You can see it all over television and in films. But the problem is that I think people in our society have a very hard time thinking about death as it pertains to them as individuals, to, to make it a personal thing rather than maybe a source of entertainment or sort of um, just something like actually horrifying that people might find um, that, that they might watch in a film or something like that. Um, but the people who are realistic about death say that they want it to be quick and painless. 
they don't see the point of suffering. They don't see um, what the purpose of having a prolonged, protracted dying process is. And so the goal becomes eliminating, eliminating that at any cost. And I think that that mentality has led to things like physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia. And those are really big problems that our society faces today. There's very little appreciation, uh, really, for how the dying process and the experience of illness more broadly can be an important opportunity for spiritual growth. And by that, I mean uniting oneself with Christ and his passion and having an openness to the graces that our Lord desires to bestow on us through his merits. And Christianity is very richly paradoxical in this regard, that we are to die to ourselves, really, to embrace life in Christ. Um, even as we uh, have seemingly every uh, normal lives, everyday lives as Christians here on this earth, uh, but as we approach um, entering into eternal life with Christ, um, as we depart this world, then again, we, under, we undergo death um, to enter into new life. Well, and brother, the book you translated is called The Art of Dying. What makes it an art and how should we think of it that way? Sure. Art is in its most concrete form about making something that is beautiful and excellent. And when we talk about the art of dying, there should be a certain beauty and excellence to that as well. And that's what we're aiming for with the Ars Moriendi or the art of dying, that it's about responding to the challenging, complex circumstances that surround the dying process in the most beautiful and excellent way. And that involves faith, hope, and love on a very fundamental level, those, those virtues that are about knowing and loving God, as well as having loving interactions and a, a full participation in the, in the sacramental life of the church. Well, and brother, you probably get to have a very interesting perspective because you had the medical training where you saw death in that medicalized sense, but then now working with people on a spiritual level, how has that been a different perspective for you as you help people prepare, you know, eventually to die? I think in my medical training, I certainly had in the back of my mind all along how important it was for people to prepare spiritually, to honor people's religious preferences, to call in chaplains and priests, and, and to make sure that people have all the support that they need. But I think when I entered religious life, it became even clearer what the priorities are and how they relate to each other. Um, that I and I think actually the Ars Moriendi um, reinforces this very nicely: the importance of the life of the soul, even more so than the life of the body. And and I would say that when you're in a in a healthcare institution and there's all sorts of factors and a lot of complexity, it it can be very easy to lose sight of that. And so religious life has just helped to bring a lot more clarity to the priorities and to and to be even stronger, I think, in support of the religious and spiritual element, because that's really, um, that's the only thing that really remains once a person passes on to, to the next life, um, their relationship with God and their relationship with their loved ones who, who continue on this earth and hopefully pass on into uh, eternal life with God as well. So Brother Columba, there's this phrase in our culture, happy death. I talked about my family's happy death crucifix. The Irish, from which you get your religious name, Columba, they have, um, you know, the, 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 the history of having these joyful celebrations after the death of somebody, you know, these wakes with the, a lot of drinking and dancing and music. So is happy death a thing or is that something new that we shouldn't think of? Sure. I'm, I'm not very familiar with that term, happy death, but the word that's typically translated as happy in scripture and in other places, maybe from Greek or from Latin, also means blessed. So I would say there's a, there's a strong compatibility there and an, an acknowledgement of how important our spiritual well-being is. Uh, but I'm certainly in favor of that idea of um, celebrating a person's passing on to the next life for sure, not thinking of this as the last word, because the truth is that Christ has risen from the dead, and, and that is such a fundamental truth 
that we hold to as Christians. And so, yes, I, th- I think that is a very positive attitude, especially if you have a lot of clarity about what that means, that we're celebrating that this, that this soul has passed on into life with God, uh, and that we also expect the resurrection of the body, at which point uh, th- that person is going to, the, the soul is going to, be, to rejoin the body at the general resurrection from the dead. So that is certainly something to celebrate. Brother, tell us, you know, this was written, I think, back in the 15th century. Correct me if I'm wrong, but tell us about what the world was like then that led to the writing of this. Why was this important then? As far as we know, the Ars Moriendi was written in the early 15th century, around the time of the Council of Constance, which was a council that was particularly focused on teaching Christians about the basics of the faith and making sure that they had greater access to the resources of the church. Uh, At the same time, there were increasing literacy rates throughout Europe, which meant that people could actually have access to reading materials and learn more about the faith and about uh, what was available in the church, especially as they tried to prepare for death. And so that was the milieu in which the Ars Moriendi came about. And it was actually copied uh, and distributed in mass throughout Europe and uh, became very popular, very widely used. And so that was more or less the context. At the same time, there were the effects of the bubonic plague such that uh, there were there was more limited access to priests and the sacraments. And so uh, distributing copies of this work was actually very helpful in offering additional support to people um, in a time when the structures were kind of less stable because of disease and death. So the Ars Moriendi played a very fundamental role at that time in uh, just getting the word out to people and providing support Uh, But it also sparked an entire genre of literature on the art of dying. So it was influential for centuries to come as well. So taking the cultural circumstances of 15th century compared to the 21st century, how are they similar and how are they different such that the book might receive a a welcome in our age? Mm -hmm. I think the same fundamental challenge of the lack of familiarity of of the average Catholic or the average Christian with the basics of the faith. That's a problem that was uh, prevalent, obviously, in the the early 15th century. But I think it's common uh, now as well, maybe for different reasons, but I think there's a similar result that people just don't really know what to do uh, to prepare for death. If a loved one is dying, they don't really know who to ask for or, or what kind of resources Uh, to expect. And so just covering some of the basics can really help people to get their bearings and to advocate for their loved ones as death approaches. I would say that's one major similarity. Another would be the the shortage of priests, again, for different reasons. Uh, But it seems to me that there's, there's there's two issues. There's the shortage of priests and then also the shortage of church-going Catholics who understand the basics of the faith. So those two things go hand in hand. But I would say that if if Catholics were really asking for all the things that they should be asking for, um, we would need many more priests than we have, um, exponentially more priests than we currently have. So um, I think both of those things are challenges. And, and those were challenges back in the 15th century as well. So I think there's similar issues that can be addressed by this same work. So, brother, why did you write the book now? Did somebody ask you to do it? Was it a divine inspiration? You're not anonymous like the original Dominican who wrote it. I actually did not come across this work uh, because we think that it was written by a Dominican. I came across it because I read about it in a church history class um, in reading a book by Eamon Duffy called The Stripping of the Altars. Mm. And he covered this as actually a really important example of popular piety in the, the Middle Ages. And I was fascinated by it immediately, and I wanted to read more, only to discover that it's nearly impossible to find a translation of this in modern English. It's certainly not available to the general public. So that was 
certainly in the back of my mind. And then a little bit later when I was working with the National Catholic Bioethics Center on a couple of things, I brought up this work and they suggested to me actually that I work on an annotated translation uh, to help make this more accessible to people today and to guide them, to give notes that would help with the pastoral and theological elements so that you didn't really have to know a lot beforehand coming to this in order to benefit a lot from it. And so I worked on that. And yeah, the the main contribution I would say is just providing uh, a version of this in modern English that people can read. Before that, the main thing that people went to was a middle English text, which is not only hard to understand, but it also comes across as very archaic, I would say. Yes. And so having something in modern English, I think, can help a lot of people by making it more accessible to them. So those were the reasons that I decided to work on this. And actually, just in my further research, I came across the the hypothesis that this was written by a Dominican friar or friars, but there's not proof of that. And I would say it, it makes sense in a way because um, it's it's a very strong part of our tradition as Dominicans to want to promote the sacraments and to make sure that they are received with faith and reverence, and also just to make sure that people understand the basics of the faith. And so those would be some commonalities. But um, I would say apart from that, maybe it was simply providential that I came across this work. Well, and brother, you had written also the introduction for this new translation and with the annotations, you had mentioned the notes to make it more digestible. Tell us about these and really what you're hoping to accomplish with them. Sure. This was part of the plan to make the work more accessible to people. So the idea was that it would be a very straightforward overview of not just the historical context for this work and the the theories about authorship, etc., but to really explain to people directly how this could be applicable for them, what some of the main takeaways would be, which I cover in the introduction section, uh, some of the main themes that I think are particularly strong and, and helpful for our current context. And then the annotations just help explain some of the source materials for the Ars Moriendi text itself. There's a lot of quotes from scripture, for example, and so I pointed out where those quotes came from exactly, and then quotes from the church fathers like St. Augustine, for example. So just to make this as accessible as possible with these annotations and to give people something a little bit more to read about that they might find interesting as well. And then the original edition had illustrations, woodcut images, and you retain those. Tell us about those 600-year-old woodcuts. That's right. So first, I should explain that this text circulated in two versions. There was a longer version that came first, and then a shorter one that was an abridgment and designed to go with illustrations. And so actually, the shorter version with the illustrations is the one that we chose to publish with this annotated translation. It's a little bit more concise it's a little bit more easy. It's a little easier to use as a reference, I would say. And also the illustrations are quite remarkable in their own right. That shorter version came about around the time, right right before actually the printing press became widely used. And it was uh, an intermediate technology, I would say, of woodcut prints. So basically there would be carvings made into wood blocks. And so that's how the illustrations were made. And they would carve the text into the wood blocks as well and then reproduce it uh, in mass. And so that was just a, an immediate precursor to the printing press. But it actually led to this very interesting art form. And so you can see with the illustrations that come with the Ars Moriendi, um, a really good example of that wood block printing. And so the, the graphic design person at the National Catholic Bioethics Center actually went to great lengths to restore those images so that we could include them with the work and that they would really serve as a true supplement to the text. And the idea is that the the text is on one page and then the illustration is on the opposite. And so the, the illustrations convey in quite excellent detail what is being conveyed in the text so that on the one hand, it's a nice supplement for people who can read the text. But even for those who are illiterate, they could look at the images and learn a lot from that. 
Well, brother, I think this is probably a good time in our, in our interview to take a little break. We're going to be right back on Dr. Doctor talking about the Ars Moriendi after the break. And we are back with Dr. Doctor and Dr. Brother Columba Thomas telling us about his translation of the Ars Moriendi, The Art of Dying. Now, Brother, tell us, when should we read this book? At what point in our life? Or I guess, who do you hope reads the book? I hope that anybody who is interested in this topic of death and dying will pick up this book and read it. Because just to be clear, it's not intended just for those who think they may be dying soon or who have a terminal diagnosis. And actually, the text itself says that it's much more helpful if people become familiar with this long before they expect that to happen. Because it's much more difficult to take in some of these things if you think that death is right in front of you. Um, And on the other hand, if you take some time with it, sift through it, and return to it multiple times, it will probably uh, just become better integrated into, into your understanding and into your, into your working knowledge. And uh, one way that you could actually uh, become more familiar with this is in thinking about how you might use it to help loved ones who, who may be facing serious illness or who may be dying themselves, because it does cover a lot of practical points that would help you to assist those loved ones. And so I would say anybody who's even remotely interested in this topic, even just for historical reasons, honestly, they should pick it up and just get more familiar with it. And it is something that could be used as a reference. I would say it's not it's not a quick read. It's really only about 150 pages total, but it, it's not a quick read. It's something that should be taken in slowly and returned to multiple times. Does 150 count the images? It does. And actually, well, that includes the the introduction as well as the supplemental materials. Oh, that so, doesn't sound too long to me. Oh, yeah, yeah. Andrew. Oh, I just yeah. pulled off my, my library shelf here. Brown so. noser. Well done. <laughs> okay. Uh, brother, when in raising our children, we tell them that the, the absolute lowest bar for success in their life is do they have uh, sanctifying grace in their soul at the moment they die? You know, that's all we ultimately, you know, if there's one thing we care about, that's it. It's, it sounds a little similar to something on page 86 of the book, and you expand on it. It says in your book that you translated, quote, the salvation of each person consists entirely in the preparation for death, end quote. Entirely sounds pretty darn strong. Is it too strong? I don't think so, especially if you're already presupposing that the person is in the state of sanctifying grace, which obviously is necessary and very fundamental for salvation. And with sanctifying grace, we understand that there's also faith, hope, and charity in the soul, as well as the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so all of that is very fundamental. But I think that by preparation for death, the text is also talking about making use of all the resources in the church that help to maintain a person in a state of sanctifying grace and promote growth in that grace. And so that includes receiving the sacraments well and also just cultivating a regular life of prayer and meditation. So I think all of those things are important. And the reason that we can say that preparation for death is fundamental and critical is that ultimately everybody is going to face the moment of death. And we hope and pray that they are going to be prepared for that and that they're going to be in a state of sanctifying grace when they meet their creator. Well, and Tom, one of the things you shared off air was this idea of the apostolic pardon. I had not (laughs) been familiar with that before. Could you explain that? Sure. The apostolic pardon is a real treasure, I would say, that the church has. And this is something that a priest can give to a person who is in danger of death. It usually follows the sacrament of penance or confession. And the idea is that it removes the temporal punishment for sins that are already forgiven in confession or penance. And by temporal punishment, I mean time in purgatory. So this is a real gift for people that are about to die, that basically their temporal punishment is removed by the apostolic pardon. And it's a relatively short prayer, but it's something that the church gives to us 
as just an extremely valuable resource and something that that people should ask for if they are in danger of dying. So, so this is like a plenary indulgence. Now, the vast majority of plenary indulgences become partial because to become plenary, you have to be completely um, dissociated from any attachment to venial sin, right? Mm -hmm. But you're saying- yeah, that's, that's the general idea, yeah. But the apostolic pardon, you don't have to be- uh, have no attachment to venial sin. That even goes beyond, uh, doesn't it? That's what it sounds like. I think one of the real special privileges of being in that situation in which you're so close to death is that there's not a whole lot of time to fall back into habits <laughs> and like that, that actually you, you get that gift and then it sticks. <laughs> so it's actually one of the real privileges of being so close to death. And one of the, the great reassurances that we have in the church, if we can receive the sacraments and, and this uh, indulgence as well, right before death, that we can have so much confidence um, of having received God's mercy and grace and being as prepared as we can be to, to move into the next life. Well, in the last month, so this year on Palm Sunday, my father died after just a weekend of going downhill. And uh, I was involved with that, sadly, from a distance. I was at a conference. But I found out that two days in a row, two days before he died, the day before he died, there were two different priests there. Both gave him anointing. Both gave him the apostolic pardon on the way out. And that's when I really learned what the apostolic pardon was. And I said, I want this. And I'm telling all my family, you want this too. Make sure you let somebody know. Um, because, yeah, because so much at funerals, we hear people talking, family members, oh, they're in heaven now. Is that a kind of presumption that we shouldn't have? I or think should we? I right to be cautious about that because as far as we can tell, uh, most people, um, if, they, if they do die in a state of sanctifying grace, they do spend some time in purgatory. And so, and that's basically a, a stage of preparation for the soul before entering heaven, because we still have maybe lingering attachments to this world and the things of this world. And so purgatory is a state of preparation, um, of, of purification. And so uh, one thing that we can do for our loved ones, rather than simply assuming that they have already made it into heaven, is to pray for them, to have masses said for them. And the idea is that that does help because of the merits of Christ, really, yes, yes. Um, it helps to speed up that process so that they can enter heaven more quickly. Well, brother, as, as a physician and a vowed religious, you're in a very unique position in translating this book. I, I think sometimes of patients I see in the office and it's like, you know, what we have to offer them medically is limited. What they really need is they need grace. They probably need absolution and they need to be talking to somebody else. You, <laughs> you're kind of a multifunction tool now. Uh, you can do all these things. And what, tell us about that special perspective as you're translating and commenting on this book. Tell us what, what you've identified. I would say that it's very important to be open to those types of conversations. Um, especially if patients bring that up, that they're concerned about not having enough preparation, perhaps on a spiritual level or a religious level. Perhaps they don't know uh, where they can go for help. I remember caring for a patient in primary care who just confided to me that he was very concerned about his wife who had passed on recently, and he wasn't sure if, if uh, she was prepared enough. Uh, before she died. And so I think a lot of our conversations were about uh, how important it was for him to talk with his parish priest about it, and also to keep his wife in prayer, that actually the most helpful thing that he could be doing for her at that point was to pray for her and to have masses said for her. So I think I really uh, appreciate being able to have that type of conversation with my patients. And I so it did come up even before I entered religious life but I would say now that I'm a religious and I'm wearing a habit, people kind of expect to talk about 
things religious, even if I'm serving in the capacity of a physician. So it does come up even more, I would say. And so it is very important for me, obviously, to uh, simply um, address the concerns that people bring up and to be very comfortable with moving sort of back and forth um, between the more medical and the more spiritual concerns. So yeah, but I think that that's something that all physicians should be comfortable with to some degree and to be familiar with how they can advocate for their patients, regardless of what their uh, background is, um, to just be able to kind of support the, the patient who is, who is um, I think, rightfully expressing concerns about their spiritual and religious um, needs. And so, um, yeah, it was certainly part of my medical training to at least know how to ask about that and to take some steps to support people uh, who do express religious and spiritual needs. And I think that uh, for us Catholics, there's so much to know and so many ways in which we can be supportive. Brother, you mentioned that this book is a corrective to the prevailing over-medicalized technology-driven death around us. What does this mean? What I mean by that is that healthcare has become so complicated today, and a lot of that is for good reasons, that we have so much to offer people on a medical level, that people can often feel bombarded by the choices, by the types of interventions that are possible. And so they can be so overwhelmed by that that they forget about the importance of the spiritual and religious elements. They forget to ask for what they need on that level. And so I would say that this book can help people to become reoriented to what's important and to, to be emboldened to ask for those things that they really need and to be focused on um, the, the life of the soul within them. Tell us about now, this. Go, go ahead, Andrew. I was, I was going to say part of the, the crux of the whole book, I would say, is talking about the temptations at the time of death mm -hmm. and their antidotes. Tell us about that. Sure. And so the main portion of the Ars Moriendi text is a series of five temptations and inspirations. You can think about the temptations as common interior struggles that people face uh, as they approach death. The way that the Ars Moriendi frames it is that the devil or evil spirits um, tempt the, the dying person directly with, with these various uh, complicating issues. Um, and I think that's a good way to think about it. Um, the reality of spiritual warfare of, of demons and angels is all over scripture and, and the church has never denied that reality. But I think that today people don't always think about that aspect. They, they tend to think in terms of psychology, I would say, but, but not really allow for the possibility of that spiritual warfare. And so this book is a helpful reminder of that. Um, but also, these are just more generally speaking, very common challenges that people face. Temptations against faith, hope, and charity, which are the fundamental virtues that have to do with knowing and loving God. So those are very fundamental for, um, for, for our relationship with God and for being prepared for the next life. And then the fourth and fifth temptations are against humility and voluntary poverty, which are very important for us uh, to, to be willing to depart from this world. Because without humility and voluntary poverty, we can so easily remain attached to the things of this world and not be willing to be with God in eternal life, as odd as that sounds. And so these are just very fundamental virtues that the Ars Moriendi encourages and also warns that there can be temptations to turn away from those things and so to reject God. And in response to those temptations in this main portion of the text, there's an angel who offers encouraging advice or inspirations. And so the, the angel uh, draws upon scripture and various sources in the tradition of the church and also just offers common sense advice, I would say, to help the person who's struggling with these various things to overcome those temptations, and to really focus on the Lord. Brother, what are some of the most practical and effective ways that we can encourage somebody who is facing death, especially if they are not accepting that they are facing an impending death? Mm -hmm. 
I would say to remind them of some of the basics. Of course, it's important to to understand where they are in terms of their faith, in terms of what that they understand about what's going on and, and what lies ahead. Uh, but I would say that ha- showing a calm, peaceful example and advocating for them as much as possible and praying for them constantly um, can be very helpful. Uh, never underestimate the importance of prayer and of having masses said for a person and offering your intentions for that person when you attend mass. Um, all of those things are fundamentally important. Also encouraging the person um, in the, the particular devotions they may have. I remember coming across a patient at hospice who said that he wasn't Catholic, but he nonetheless greatly admired Mother Teresa and really liked praying to her. And so I liked to focus on that because that was some common ground and something that I could encourage for him. So I would say trying to cultivate whatever seeds or kernels of faith that seem evident in the person can be very helpful. Also praying the rosary, praying the Divine Mercy Chaplet, um, and also calling for the help of chaplains and priests. All those things can be very important. But I would say being persistent and, and setting a really good, strong example of faith can be very helpful for people. Brother, how can people get a copy of this book? It's available on the website for the National Catholic Bioethics Center, and you can find that at ncbc.org. They sell that exclusively for the time being. Um, And so I would encourage you to go on their website. They actually have a lot of helpful resources in addition to that, and they offer a free ethics consultation as well. So I highly recommend going to their website and taking a look at the book as well. And your final words for us. I would like to share with you just an excerpt from one of the prayers from the Ars Moriendi. I think it's a very beautiful depiction of heaven and something that could be very helpful for people as they are preparing for death. May the glorious choir of angels meet you. May the assembly of the apostles, your judge, absolve you. May the triumphant army of martyrs meet you. May the lily-white band of shining confessors surround you. May the chorus of rejoicing virgins receive you. May the embrace of the patriarchs draw you into the fold of blessedness and peace. And may the gentle and joyous countenance of the Lord Jesus appear to you to establish you among those who stand in attendance upon him forever. Amen. Yeah, who wouldn't like a reception like that? Exactly. Well, brother, thank you so much for being with us on Dr. Doctor. I hope that many of our listeners will take your advice and and read that uh, book so that we can all be uh, happy forever with God in heaven. Thanks for being with us again. Thanks for having me. And we are back with Dr. Doctor in the answer to the medical trivia question. So the question had two parts. The first part is, Where is the most common place that Americans die today? Well, it actually changed uh, in about 2017. Uh, It had been the hospital um, before that. But then in 2017, it became the home, 31%. So that was the second part of the question. 71% of people say they want to die at home. How many are? Only 31%. And in that study, 30% were dying in the hospital and 21% in nursing facilities. So there you have it. Americans are gradually getting closer to their aspiration of dying at home near loved ones. So I kind of wonder where the other 29% want to die. That's the, uh, the some of them want to die in ho- Right. Some of them want to die in a hospice. Uh, some of them want to die in a hospital. Um, <laughs> I think some of them, like brother said, just want to die unexpectedly out at the grocery store and drop dead of a heart attack. I remember when I was a kid hearing my parents and their friends talking about it, and that was the consensus for how they all wanted to go because they'd heard about someone who died in that way, which you know gives uh, light to what brother said that many people today like that. Well, it's important for us now to get to the top three takeaways from this episode, Andrew. Yes, top three takeaways. Number one, something I've learned about today, the apostolic pardon. I'm getting oh, yeah. 
I want one. So bad. <laughs> I want one. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, well, I'm going to have to look up that prayer. I'm not sure it's long enough uh, if you should carry it with you. Uh, but if you're blessed to have a priest near the time of your death, that would be the top of my mind for sure. The apostolic pardon sounds to and me something, like- something the priest that was present with my dad told me was that as long as we are desiring it, even if there's a priest there to say it, that that also works too. One oh, priest man. told me that. <laughs> See, it, it reminds me of Divine Mercy Sunday, which yes, we yes. celebrated not too long ago, and that's always been a huge devotion in my family. Um, so, apostolic pardon number one: learn about it. Uh, yes. Number two, I would say get the book. You know, that that was kind of the substance <laughs> of a lot of our talk here. I've gotten the book uh, for our, our YouTube fans. And so I would encourage people to get it as well from the NCBC. And I believe that's ncbc.com. Um, org. Uh, org. org. I'm sorry. There you go. Dot org. And then number three would be prayer. Uh, brother hit on it at the end there. And I think a lot of times people talk about, I'll pray for you uh, and and say it in a way that's a kind gesture. But, you know, as as he mentioned as well, we cannot deny the reality of the spiritual warfare and the spiritual element of preparing for death. And even after death as Catholics, we know for people's time in purgatory, it's not the place where they want to be hanging out. So we've got to help them and we've got to help ourselves. So remember to pray and the power of prayer. Yes. After my you know, mother-in-law died two years ago and my father this year, I was so happy. Both priests did not assume during the Mass that they were in heaven. They encouraged prayers for them. That's what I want when I die. And that's why with the money we received from friends, I've purchased uh, with, through Mass stipends a number of Masses. So amen. I'm completely there with you. Don't assume I'm in heaven when I die. <laughs> you, you think it's kind of a nice thing to say about somebody, oh, they're in heaven, but really there's probably nothing worse you could do for me than to just make that assumption. <laughs> um, I don't know if I could come back and haunt you, but don't assume. <laughs> we all know what assumptions do. <laughs> Thanks for being with us for another episode of Dr. Doctor, the award-winning radio program and podcast with most episodes now available online with video. Please share the good news of Dr. Doctor with a friend and invite them to listen on their favorite podcast app. You can also find all of our audio and video episodes on our website, drdoctor.org. For those who want to dive deep into some of the topics, check our website for bonus links and information in our post for each episode. This is Dr. Tom McGovern. And Dr. Andrew Mullally, and we're signing off until your next dose of Dr. Doctor.